Syntactic sugar refers to high-level language features that the compiler rewrites into simpler but equivalent c -sharp code. I'm going to show you a few interesting examples and then a website that you can visit, paste your own code into it, and you can see exactly what the compiler is doing to rewrite it. Let's take the simplest example. Here we have a variable called x of type var, and it's going to be assigned hello world. Now the CLR and IL has no concept of var. Var doesn't exist. So what the compiler does here is it sees on the right hand side we have a string and from that it can infer that var should be type string and so it's going to rewrite our code to the second option. And this shows an example of how a feature that doesn't exist in the CLR can be exposed because the compiler is going to rewrite the code for us. Let's try something a bit more interesting. Here we have a list of integers. We're going to use a for each to enumerate over that list and then simply write out to the console each number. A fairly simple construct, but you might be surprised to know that for each doesn't exist in the CLR. Instead, this is going to be rewritten by the compiler into the following. We start by getting the enumerator. We then add a try finally because the implementation of the I enumerator exposes I disposable. And because this is detected, it's going to add this code to dispose it in the finally section. Then we're going to use a while loop just to move next, next, next through the items. Then for each item, we're going to extract the current item. That's going to be an integer, so the int of I. And then finally, we're going to put the code that comes from the for each block above, which is just a right line. But if you had a whole block of code, this is where the block of code would go. Let's change our list of int to just a regular array of integers. And you're going to see an interesting difference in the code it generates. So now, if we look at the generated code, we can see that instead of using the enumerator, it knows it's an array. So it's just going to use a simple while loop going through indexing each item in turn and then inserting again the console right line as the output. So you can see the compiler is pretty smart. It's going to detect edge cases where it can add an extra level of performance by avoiding the common case and using, in this case, the special case when it comes across an array. Let's move on to something a bit more tricky. Here I've got a lambda. The lambda takes a single parameter called name. It's going to be a string. And then all we're going to do is write it out to the console. So it's a very simple lambda. Lambdas don't exist in the CLR. So how is the compiler going to rewrite this as an anonymous function into something that can run in the CLR? A method cannot exist on its own. So the first thing we need is a class. In this case, we've created an internal CLR class, and it has a body implemented internally, which has the guts of our Lambda. We only need a single instance of this. So we're going to add a delegate, which is a static, and then we'll add a singleton, which will automatically create the one and only instance we ever need. Now we're ready to use our lambda. The lambda.method, which is the actual delegate, only needs to be created once. So the first time around, this is going to be null. So we go to the right hand side, we're going to create a new delegate, assign it to lambda.method, and then use that as the result. Let's look at one final example, a closure, before I show you a website you can use to actually examine the raw output for yourself and have a bit of fun experimenting and playing. I'm going to extend the previous example. We declare a variable called prefix, which is just a string, and this is going to be used inside the right line. So this turns it from a, a straightforward lambda into a closure because it's closing over some external state. And you can see here that afterwards we're going to update prefix again to the word hi, and this means that when we actually invoke it, the latest version of prefix is hi, and so the output would actually be hi Alice. So let's see how the compiler handles closing over state. In theory, the lambda x could be passed as a return value from a function. So its lifetime could be much longer than the value of prefix itself. So we can't just put prefix on the stack. So the first thing we have to do is create a class. I've called it closure. And inside that class, we're going to store the prefix value. We need to create an instance of our new internal class called closure. It's going to have a field internally called prefix, so we need to set that to yo. The implementation of the body of the lambda has been moved into that class. We then set the prefix again, and finally can invoke the closure itself. 
If we have a look at the actual class definition, it's very simple. It has the prefix and then we have an internal body implementation. This is a website called sharplab.io. I've put a link to it in the description below. But basically on the left hand side, we put code. Let me paste something in here. And then on the right hand side, it's going to run the code and give us the answer. So in our example, we've set X to three and then we're just using a simple switch statement to check if it's one, two, three and output text. And you can see on the right hand side, it's given us the correct answer. What's more interesting though, if you use this drop down, you can actually tell it to decompile the code that the compiler generates. If we have a look here, we can see that our switch statement has become just a switch statement. But the switch statement is quite interesting. If I go in here and I change case three to case nine, I've changed the logic. And now the compiler has decided the most efficient way to handle this is as a series of if statements. And you can see here that it's coming down. And if it's equal to nine, the one I've just changed output a value, this is the default value and so forth. Now I'm not going to go into the details of the switch statement. I might have a whole separate video for that because it's quite interesting the number of different optimizations it tries to use. But you can see here how you can play around with the left hand side, add some code, paste it in there, examine on the right hand side what it generates. And it's a pretty cool little utility. Check out this video which shows you the internal generated compiler code for the record class. Apart from that, please like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.